I got it! When I first heard about Dave being trapped in a maze. One, two, three, four! I built a labyrinth. Can you believe it? Dave is trapped in a cardboard maze in his living room and he can't get out. Welcome to Dave Made a Minute, the podcast where a whole bunch of us are exploring the film Dave Made a Maze one minute at a time. The twist. Many of the participants have never seen the film. Some don't even know what film they're sampling. They get their minutes and they tackle them as they see fit. Here's your host from the Groundhog Day Project and Michael Myers Minute, Robert Black. Minute 44, our heroes get out of the maze, but things have changed in the apartment. Shoe rack note, because the participants won't notice. Instead of shoes, there are now shoe boxes. To tackle Minute 44, we have Rick Ingham and Julia Ingham of Mad Max Minute. You come home... There's a giant maze in your living room. You're like, what the? There's a giant maze in my living room. I've heard of people rearranging the furniture, but this is wackadoodle crazy. Give me a sense of that. This doesn't make any sense. Is that a problem? Is it a problem? Am I saying? What's the It's like a fucking cocktail party in here. I get a few words from you before you go. Welcome to Minute 44. I'm your host for today, Rick Ingham, alongside your other host for today. Hi, I'm Julia Ingham. Normally, we produce the Mad Max Minute podcast, but today we are here in Dave's Cardboard Maze to help break down this movie one minute at a time. This episode is going to be divided into two parts. Here in part one, Julia and I have only seen the trailer and this minute specifically. We have very little context for what has come before or what will happen afterward, and I'll explain part two when we get to it. But in the meantime, we open on a rather dark room compared to the rooms that we've seen before in minute 20 and minute 32 and gordon is sitting there insisting that he is more socially capable than someone has insinuated that he is we are definitely coming in at the middle of a conversation though yeah it feels like there has been some sort of confrontation before this right after gordon says this line we jump over to the cameraman and the boom operator and their eyes are big and wide and they're not filming and they're not filming. They have just witnessed something that has given them pause. Yeah. I have ideas about what that argument might have been Mm -hmm. that would lead to this line, I don't know why you did, I get plenty of girls. But they're all a little cliche about romantic competition. Yeah. And I don't know, if that's really what it was, that's fine. But eh. I'm willing to bet that someone, probably Dave, said something really hurtful to Gordon, and then Gordon fired back with something, and then they went back and forth, and now they're just in a situation where Gordon is like, oh yeah, I get I get plenty of girls all the time. And I feel like if you have to defend yourself like this, that it's not necessarily true. Yeah, it really does feel that way. Mm-hmm. I'm also still kind of thrown off by the idea that this is the first time in the minutes that we've been given that we don't see the crew recording. And it's so much darker in this space. The lighting is so much lower. We've been gone for another 12 minutes and suddenly we find ourselves in such a drastically different environment. I think a lot has happened in the last 12 minutes. I think the professionalism of the camera crew has perhaps waned because of the legitimate danger that they have witnessed, been a part of. We've still only seen this one particular group in the minutes that we have covered, but perhaps the camera crew witnessed somebody dying. And especially the tone of the room being darker than the two rooms that we have seen previously does kind of tell that story. Mm -hmm. Cutting back over to Annie, she looks at Dave and she says, how much further, Dave? And you're starting to hear in her voice a fatigue. She's getting tired of this little adventure that they're on. She was upset with Dave the last time we saw her back in minute 32 when he blew her off to climb into that box. But she was still shocked when he did so. But here you can tell that her patience is just wearing out. I got a vibe that there has been a change in their relationship that just happened, like maybe the art part of the argument, and that she no longer feels the same about Dave than she did before the maze ever happened or in the previous scene that we saw, minute 32, and that she has no desire to put up with his crap anymore. Mm-hmm. Gordon, of course, in this same shot, 
in, insists that he still gets plenty of girls all the time, constantly, even. Yeah, Gordon's in his own little world, his own little defensive world, mm -hmm. where he's not talking to anybody, he's not listening to anybody, he's just all alone by himself. Trying to justify to himself and to those around him that he is socially capable. Mm -hmm. But Annie has asked Dave a question, and as we look over at Dave, he is standing next to a hole in the wall, and inside that hole there are several overlapping lines layers and a bright glowing blue thing behind the wall yeah i call it the cardboard vagina because that's what it looks like because of all of the flaps all of the flaps and dave is entranced my first impression was that dave is entranced because it looks like a cardboard vagina i think he's more entranced because of what's behind the wall this blue glowing energy it's not cardboard it doesn't seem to be any sort of crafting material and i know we've seen lights lighting up the inside of the maze but i don't think we've ever seen anything quite like this and it almost seems to be a wound in the side of the maze and it's revealed this glowing energy okay that's interesting i like it i took it to be the heart of the maze which seeing the heart of the maze and not doing anything about it seems foolish. If you find the heart of the maze, you destroy it. I like the idea that this is a wound, that maybe during their conflict, they created the wound. Mm. In the trailer, we saw that Annie packed a box cutter. I'm assuming so that she could cut through walls and things like that. It might just be that they reached the point in their adventuring that someone got tired of passing through doorways and decided, forget it, I'm going to cut our way out. And this was what they naturally found after cutting through several layers of wall, that perhaps this labyrinth is alive, that Dave has somehow bestowed it with life and energy, and now the maze, and we got a little bit of a taste of this when we were here last time, but that the maze is alive and growing on its own, which is supported by what we see later on in the minute. Yes, it is. Dave initially does not respond to Annie, so she has to call him out a little bit louder. And as Dave turns away from the wall, he seems almost confused by the situation that he's turning around into, as if he was lost in the blue light. Whatever this is, it's definitely not announcing a sale at Kmart. Only if it's on cardboard. <laughs> but as he turns back, he apologizes for being lost in his own world. World. And Annie, keeping her eyes dead set on Dave, she says, can we keep going? And she does this closed mouth smile at the that end of can we keep going. does not mean that she's smiling. Quite the opposite. She is quite sassy. Oh, yeah. I really like that detail of how she did that. She's trying to outwardly show a sort of friendliness to it. Like, Dave, can we keep on going? As if to try and keep Dave on their side. But she's also showing just how ready to toss Dave out of a window that she is. I'm beginning to question if their relationship was ever romantic or were they just roommates? If they were romantic, I would bet that she was already frustrated with him. Mm -hmm. And this whole maze adventure has really brought that to the surface. Just and, exacerbated any issues yeah, they had before. And made it the defining characteristic of their relationship. Because that's what it feels like now. Her annoyance is the defining characteristic of this relationship. So Dave says, yeah, yes, they can move on. They do not need to stay here next to this glowing hole in the wall. And so Dave grabs Gordon and they all start moving. And we linger on this hole in the wall. And the edges of it start to shift more so than I think they were doing before. Oh, I didn't notice that. Like healing? As if they're healing. As if they've ripped a hole in this wall and now the maze is bringing itself back together. Oh, okay. I, I missed that. It's very subtle it's not a drastic move it's definitely not like wolverine healing <laughs> where everything's is just getting patched up almost instantly it's sort of a slow shift of several layers of that hole. And as we leave behind that weirdness, we cut elsewhere. There is a wall, there is a pipe, and a ball of paper rolls down and out of that pipe. And from the bottom of the screen comes a paper bag puppet. And we know from the trailer that there are paper bag puppets in this movie. I don't know what role they play. I don't know what they're supposed to represent. But well, here is one. In the trailer, it was quick, but I'm pretty sure I saw a paper bag puppet that looked like Harry. Mm -hmm. I think these are replacements. 
I think the maze takes someone and turns them into a cardboard paper version of themselves. Mm -hmm. That's pretty nefarious right there. It is. There are promotional images from the premiere of this movie on IMDb, and it shows the actors and actresses holding paper bag puppet versions of themselves. So I think you're right on. Yeah. I'm not quite sure who this is supposed to be, though. It's nobody that we have been following in our three minutes. It's somebody else. I don't do this, but I gotta interrupt just to let the listener know in case you're following this and haven't seen the film. This puppet is Leonard, who has wandered into the maze on his own. If this little paper bag was wearing glasses, I guess it could have passed for Harry. But we know that Harry is still with the others. He's in the room with them in this next portion. So I like the idea that the paper bag versions of these people are paper bag doppelgangers, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And there is a really quick cut in the trailer of a person who appears to be covered in cardboard as if the maze is going from paper bag people to actual paper people. But that is something that we have no definitive answers for at this point. Yeah. Whatever this paper bag puppet is up to, it stands up, turns, and then scurries off the side. So there are machinations at play elsewhere that we have not been privy to heretofore. And so we cut back to Annie and the others. They are crouch walking down a low hallway. And Annie says right out, we've made it. And as we cut to a POV shot, we see at the end of the hallway, there's a blue blanket covering a doorway. And Annie says, we're home. And I can already tell, no, there's no way they're home. And not just because we're only 44 minutes into an 80 minute movie. (laughs) This whole scene felt a little odd, almost like Annie herself didn't really believe they were home. Like she said, we made it, we're home because she was supposed to, not because she really meant it. And nobody else reacted to it. I think Annie might have been getting her hopes up a little bit because she saw something that looked very much like the entrance. Mm -hmm. I have to wonder if when they first entered the maze, if they had to do this sort of crouch walk because the ceiling was so low. So they probably thought, oh, this is another section where the ceiling is really low and there's a blue blanket everything looks like it's the entrance yeah i wonder did the maze create a facsimile of the entrance and the room outside the entrance or did it grow to encompass the entrance and the room outside the entrance That's a really good question, because as Annie and Dave pass forward through that blanket, the first thing that Annie says is not, it's a dead end, or we've been turned around. She says, it's growing. And Dave says, I know. So they believe that the maze grew outside of the entrance and took over the apartment. That's the implication I think they're going for. Yeah, I don't necessarily think that's true i'm still open to both possibilities Mm -hmm. of the maze tricking them into thinking that they left or legitimately having taken over the apartment but they believe that the maze has grown outside of itself yeah i'm willing to look at it from both perspectives either the labyrinth is growing outward or the labyrinth is growing new rooms to turn them around yeah what's really nefarious about this room that they've stepped into is that above the door way that they all come out of it still says enter which we saw in the trailer it's the same type of enter sign that dave put over the entrance to his cardboard labyrinth Mm -hmm. i also find it a little funny that as annie climbs out of that doorway and sees the space that she's walked into they use the clang from the start of the cinema sins videos (laughs) like i recognize that sound effect that's from cinema sins everyone climbs out of that doorway and they're standing next to the entrance there and dave turns around as if to reassure everyone he says i know I know it's growing, but if we can finish it, everything will be fine. And I have to wonder what Dave means by finishing the maze. Do they have to reach the center? Is there an arrangement where it's like a corn maze? You enter from one place and you exit from another place. Do they have to keep progressing until they find that exit? Do they have to retrieve something at the center? I feel like all of these statements about finishing the maze... There's an explanation somewhere that we have not been privy to. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely something that we haven't seen yet outside of the three minutes Mm -hmm. that we're covering. Now, the labyrinths that we've seen before, the one in the movie Labyrinth, the idea is you get to the center, you find the thing, and then you win. Mm -hmm. When you go into classical literature, Daedalus' Labyrinth was 
meant as a containment. Yeah. The point was for you not to find your way out and wander around until the Minotaur found you and ate you. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's one difference between a labyrinth and a maze. A maze is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be a puzzle that you solve. Yeah. A labyrinth is more of a quest or a task or a trap. It's more serious. It's not fun even with like legends of the hidden temple yes it's a game show but most of the time most of the time the kids don't win they don't finish they get captured by one thing or another or time runs out they are not able to solve the puzzles it's dressed up as fun fact check over the series 120 episode run just 32 temple runs were completed successfully for a win rate of 26.7 percent But essentially, they die. They fail Mm. most of the time. Well, it's because trips to the Bahamas are not cheap. and (laughs) You can't send a winner to the Bahamas every time. Nope. Another labyrinth that I'm reminded of is the one from Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Oh, yeah, definitely. That one is go into the maze, find the center, find the thing. If you can survive that long. Yeah, because there are a lot of terrible things inside that maze including the other competitors and if memory serves the maze in the book contains a lot more than they had time to do in the movie oh yeah the maze in the book was amazing it was much more akin to in the very first book the path taken to get to the Philosopher's Stone, Mm -hmm. where each member of the staff who has magical skills in various ways would create an obstacle. So the maze was a lot like that, where there were charms and animals, and you can tell that the staff put this together themselves using their own specialties. It was great. It was great in Harry Potter because there was a semblance of control and explanation. Here, not so much. This just seems so out of their hands. And everyone, including Dave, apparently, is getting very tired of this. He says, hey guys, I know we're tired. I'm exhausted. And then he says, but we've got this giant glowing. And then Dave trails off. And I have to wonder, giant glowing what? Please let us know. Yeah. (laughs) We're definitely losing something by the end of this minute. And it's not that the minute cuts off so much as dave cuts himself off because the last thing we see in this minute is annie she's sitting on a box she's staring at dave she's tired of this situation but he's trying to explain that they've got this giant glowing something and i think he's failing to find the words to describe it yeah he doesn't know what it is any more than we do or the rest of the group does back a few minutes ago when you and i were talking about this giant glowing something we saw it in different ways you saw it as a subdermal layer to an entity I saw it more as the heart of the entity. So Dave doesn't know what it is either. He doesn't know if it's a single object or if it's a piece of something larger and he doesn't know how to refer to it. Mm -hmm. He doesn't understand it enough to explain it to someone else. Mm -hmm. Which really, if you get to the point of understanding that you can explain it to a lay person, then you've really got a good grasp on it. But that brings us to the end of Minute 44 and the end of Part 1 of today's episode. So we've had a taste of what the maze has to offer, but we're no closer to truly understanding its many mysteries and what they mean for the characters. So we're going to take a break, we're going to go watch the movie from beginning to end, and we'll be back for Part 2 to discuss Minute 44 with a bit more perspective. Though it's only been a moment for you, for us it's been several hours, and we have watched Dave Made a Maze in its entirety, and then rewatched this minute with the knowledge of everything that came before, and everything that is yet to come. So with that added perspective, let's re-enter the maze at the top of Minute 44, where Dave has just revealed to everybody in this room Uh that he has made this room. What did he make? This room that contains a glowing cardboard lady bit yes specifically for gordon which prompts gordon to say at the top of today's minute i don't know why you did i get plenty of girls all the time constantly i was so freaking gratified by this moment and it explains everything that we see in this moment in this minute the expressions on everybody's faces 
how Gordon and Dave seem a bit dazed and the two cameramen seem stupefied. Yeah. Which I took for just having witnessed an argument. No, they were just pulled away from being entranced by the cardboard vagina. Now, remind me, has Dave already revealed what happens when you stick something into the glowy bit? I'm pretty sure he has. All right. I'm pretty sure he has too. Now, Grant, Granted, we only watched this movie once in its entirety, and the thing that we're talking about does not happen in this minute. So if I'm spoiling it for people, I'm sorry if I'm not, then I'm apologizing for nothing. But Dave reveals that his hand is now made of cardboard because he stuck his hand into the glowy bit, and it turned his flesh into cardboard. And that's what he's been yep. obscuring with this snow glove that he's wearing. I don't understand exactly why Dave made this room. Sure, it was probably a fun joke between him and Gordon, but still it's kind of strange that he would make something that's very entrancing and if you try and enter it in any way, it turns you into cardboard. It's so strange. I don't think he made the room like this. Mm -hmm. I don't think he made the glowy bit. Oh. I think the glowy bit is part of the maze taking on a life of its own. So you were saying that Dave made the room with this comically oversized cardboard vagina because he knew that Gordon would get a kick out of it. And because the maze took on a life of its own, now it's magical. Yes. All right. Right. I appreciate so much how when everybody was entering this room one by one that all of the guys had the same reaction to it but when Annie entered the room she said oh come on right that was pretty great yeah it also explains so much as to why Annie is speaking to Dave in the tone that she's using here Oh, yeah. It's attitude because he did something incredibly childish. Uh-huh. Twice. He made the thing and then he stuck his hand in the thing. Mm. So him putting his hand into this orifice what it is opening if you will is what i wanted to discuss back when we were talking about minute 32 because as we observed the minotaur is only partially cardboard he's also partially flesh and i have to wonder if the hand that dave lost is what created the minotaur oh that the minotaur's flesh came directly from Dave's normal human hand. That was the DNA kick that spawned this monster. I'm okay with that. That flesh and blood had to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And as we've seen, the maze just creates more things out of cardboard. More maze. Except for two things. The glowy bit in the cardboard vagina and the body of the minotaur. Okay, so we have a theory on where the minotaur came from. Do we have a theory on where the glowy bit came from? The glowy bit might just be a product of Dave's imagination plus the natural magic of the maze. I don't necessarily have a really good theory about it. Do you think it could be the heart where it all started? Well, I still like the idea of the glowy bit being the lifeblood of the maze. That it's a almost river of magic flowing just behind the walls. Okay, that would make the maze distinctly feminine. I don't know if you could assign the maze a specific gender based on the iconography that you see inside of it, because sure, the maze has a vagina in the wall. Not so loud, everybody will want one. But there's also a large, very nondescript looking face with very stone-like features. And the Minotaur is distinctly masculine. I guess if you wanted to look at it a certain way, if the Minotaur represents the masculine then the maze would naturally represent the feminine that way they would be symbolically married together yes the balance one exists alongside the other which in religious symbology is also prominent and important mm -hmm. right along with the theorized 12 judges of the flooded room Yes. Now, we know from Dave's experience what this portal does to human flesh. Later on in this movie, we're going to see a familiar face, but they're going to be drastically different than we remember them. Do you think this room specifically was involved with that? Yes. Do you think perhaps the Minotaur not so much consumes its victims, but retrieves its victims? 
I'm willing to bet that's exactly what it is. That the Minotaur captured Bryn and brought her to this room. More or less fed her to the labyrinth. Because the Minotaur's head is made out of cardboard. It doesn't really have a lot of articulation to it. So it would make sense that for the Minotaur to feed, he wouldn't so much eat. He would feed them to this opening. And that as long as the labyrinth is sustained, that the Minotaur is therefore sustained. I agree. Getting back into what we're actually actually looking at in this minute though as i mentioned annie is rather perturbed with this style choice that dave has made in this room and so she asks how much further has to call his attention away from him just staring into the wall and then ask with a rather annoyed tone as passive aggressive as it may be if they can, can keep, keep going? going and she does that amazing passive aggressive i called it a smile earlier you said a smile may not be the best term so i guess she turns up the corners of her mouth. Right. There must be a word for a sarcastic smile. Yeah. This closed mouth. I'm choosing to contort my face into something that looks friendly to prevent myself from hurting you. <laughs> sort of expression. <laughs> yeah. I think what sells this expression is not so much the actress's mouth, but also the fact that she's looking at him with those gigantic eyes that she has. She's got huge eyes. Yeah. And she really does. A phenomenal job using them to her advantage the entire movie. Mm -hmm. And I love how this look is able to snap Dave out of any sort of entrancement that is being caused by this room specifically. And he's able to grab Gordon and whisk him away. Yeah, I really like the motion that he does. He kind of grabs him by the chest. Gordon is aimed kind of towards the orifice. <laughs> and if Dave weren't there to rescue him, he would be re-entranced. And Dave has a clearer head at this moment, so he takes care of his friend. I just remembered something. Mm -hmm. As each person is walking into that room, the person before them says, don't, it's a trap. Yes. And I feel like that's a little telling. The fact that Dave would refer to a shining blue cardboard vagina as a trap. And I have to wonder if that might be a little peek into the idea that he might feel trapped in a relationship or trapped by a relationship. But I don't necessarily get that sense from watching the rest of this movie that he feels like he's confined in a relationship with Annie. I definitely see how you read it that way, that this distinctly feminine an aspect of the maze is a trap but you're right it doesn't really play out that way yeah there's a lot of things that can be psychologically read into what we're seeing that don't lead anywhere mm -hmm. oh like a psychological dead end yes. in a maze yes i should have seen that sooner <laughs> the giant glowing blue cardboard vagina was a red herring <laughs> Because, of course, elsewhere in the maze, we see a pipe rattle and out tumbles a piece of paper and a paper bag puppet appears in the frame. We had no clue what was going on the first time. Yeah, we thought that it was quite nefarious. We thought that this person was a victim of the maze and was now changed into a puppet version of them to be a minion of the maze. But... Nope, it's just Leonard. He has been slowly following the main group through the maze, somehow following them nearly exactly. And I find it rather impressive that Leonard got through to the crazy room that we discussed back in minute 32 and had the thought to climb into the box because that box led down into the pipe that turned everybody into puppets. It did. Well... Was the lid put back on the box? No. So that's how we did. So he walked into the room, saw his options, and said, oh, well, the box is already open. Might as well hop down. Yes. I'm so glad that this moment is in one of our minutes because it baffled us so much before watching it. Mm -hmm. And now it's so clear. It's just another room in the maze. They travel through the room. Some things happen. And then they go through another doorway on the other end. And, and they're just normal again. Yeah. I have got to say that I got such a kick out of that sequence of them walking down this section of the maze. And they're all just puppets. And there are puppet-sized traps that are harassing them. Yeah. And then, of course, the Minotaur shows 
shows up as initially a paper bag sized version of itself and everyone's like oh it's not so bad and then it just becomes the full size version of the minotaur yeah like at will yeah they're just different rules for this thing apparently i guess so i guess so but those aren't our minutes exactly and you can always count on a minotaur to take unfair advantage in its natural environment as we cut back to join annie and the others they are crouch walking through a low hallway and we wondered back in part one because annie says we've made it we're home we wondered when they entered the maze if it was the same sort of hallway that they walked in through and i might be wrong but if I remember right, the hallway that they used to enter, it opened up rather quickly. It didn't have this extended low section. Right. Its short section was pretty much about the size of the maze in the living room. Yeah. So their first clue that something was off had to have been the length of this hallway. But at this point, they're desperate. They're running for their lives, trying to get away from this giant murderous cardboard headed beast. So any implication that they might be close to home, they're going to grab onto it. I had mentioned in part one that the dialogue and reactions here in this moment seem off. Do you think they're still under the spell a bit of the cardboard vagina? I want to say no. Okay. I think they're just tired of being in this situation and grasping at straws. Okay. Because there's no enthusiasm. There's no relief that they can see the exit. It's really just Annie saying, we made it, we're home. That's pretty much it. You would almost expect a little bit more excitement. Yeah. Okay. Like, I don't know, a little bit of hurrying up or exclamations of relief. Moving to scramble instead of just continuing to crouch walk. Yeah, there's just nothing. It's odd. And granted, when they actually pass through the blanket at the end of the hallway, they're going to be disappointed. They very much are. Get used to disappointment. They step out of the maze, and the first thing that Annie says is that it's growing. That the maze is expanding on its own because Dave didn't make this room himself. A question that we had from part one is, is this room a recreation of the apartment still within the maze? Or did the maze expand out the entrance and into the actual apartment? I think we're definitely still in the maze. Yes, we are. We definitely have that answer that the maze purposefully, and I would assume maliciously, recreated the apartment just to mess with them. So the apartment was a red herring? Yes. <laughs> Love your herring. I do. Especially the red kind. Dave is quick to agree with Annie that the maze is growing on its own, and he brings brings up this idea once again that they need to finish it. This was first brought up when they were hiding from the Minotaur the first time. The idea that everything will be fine if Dave is afforded the opportunity to finish what he has started. Which is really his motivation through the entire movie. Yeah. Is to complete this maze, finish something that he started, take that step towards adulthood. And the group are reluctant to allow him to spend any more time on this thing. Let's mm. just get out of here, destroy it, and be done. And it's interesting how Dave... And this is something we pulled from the opener to this movie, the animated montage of Dave on the weekend trying to create and trying to create and then destroying everything before he's able to finish it. Dave is tired of throwing his creations in the trash, of failing at something and having to scrap it. He wants to achieve something for once. And I like that motivation for him. Yeah, I think it's a really common emotion for people to have. We all do it. We all start things that we don't finish. We all feel the need to create, to complete, to put something out there in the world, to not destroy it. That's a very basic human need. Yeah. And to have the plot and the arc based on that feeling is something a lot of people relate to. Yeah. It's not a situation where your protagonist needs to find gas for their vehicle and people are trying to murder them for that resource. That's not something that a lot of people run into on a daily basis. You don't see a lot of situations where there's a mob of angry people banging down your door trying to get in on a daily basis. Those are things that you find in post-apocalyptic movies like we like to talk about, but this existential dread that 30-somethings have when they look at their life and 
and realize that they haven't created something meaningful as of yet, and they have that yearning to do something about it. Not everybody has that. Some people find a thing and they stick with it from an early age and it fulfills them, but there are a lot of people that just don't have that. And you get a movie like this and a protagonist like this, and you're like, wow, I guess I'm in the maze there with Dave. You can appreciate his desire to complete something for once. But you also, at the same time, understand where his friends are coming from because they don't want to get cut in half by a giant cardboard chainsaw. It's easy to tell somebody else that it's time to give up when you're not the one doing the giving up. Mm -hmm. Or if you've already found your thing. I feel like Annie is much more of a grown-up than Dave is. I expect that she has found her thing. Yeah, it kind of bothers me that we don't know what Annie's thing is. We know that she went away for the weekend and that she has a regular job, but we don't really know what her thing is. Yeah, and I guess the story is about Dave, so maybe it doesn't matter so much. That's true. It's Dave made a maze, not Annie's boyfriend made a mess in the living room. Yeah. <laughs> but it would have been nice to get at least a little bit of a hint exactly what she does. Mm -hmm. So heaping all of this existential dread on top of the mortal peril that they all find themselves in, Dave says, guys, I know we're tired. I'm exhausted. And he continues saying, but we've got this giant glowing and he trails off. He's going to say giant glowing lady bit in the other room. And I like how he pauses between glowing and lady part. And we get that quick shot of Annie sitting on a box, just staring at Dave saying, admit it, admit what you made. <laughs> This was the perfect way to wrap up this minute. It was a bit of a mystery to us in part one, but now that it's been revealed what that blue thing is and how he finishes this sentence, it's perfect. Thank you for allowing us to be your guides on this leg of the journey through the labyrinth. If you would like to hear more from us, please visit MadMaxMinute.com where you can find our coverage of the Mad Max series of movies one minute at a time, as well as links to our social media accounts. I've been Rick Ingham. And I've been Julia Ingham. Goodbye. And then I can probably disarm all the traps. And then we can, we can finish this maze. Who is with me? That was Rick Ingham and Julia Ingham of Mad Max Minute taking a minute 44 of Dave Made a Maze. They might not be back. Next time, on Dave Made a Minute, we've got Gary Roby of Harry Potter Minute and Cassandra Fredrickson of Lord of the Rings Minute taking a minute 45. Thank you for listening to Dave Made a Minute. Intro dialogue snippets were taken from Dave Made a Maze, directed by Bill Watterson, written by Bill Watterson and Steve Sears, and produced by John Charles Meyer. Intro music is Diversion by The Equals, featured in the film Dave Made a Maze, and Life Cycle of a Match by Parvis Decree. Outro music is Leaving This Godforsaken Place and Her Presence is Strong Here by Parvis Decree. Dave Made a Minute is a production of Lemming Drop Studio and all other featured podcast producers. You can find more content at lemmingdrops.com. Check us out on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Dave Made a Minute. If you like what you hear, throw us a rating and review on your podcatcher of choice. And check out all of the participants' other shows to spread the love around. Again, thank you for listening. As long as we're all working together, this is going to be fine. It's going to be great. I need you to notify the families of everyone who died here today. Totally. Wait, what? If you are a person that is excited about the idea of getting lost in a cave that has a large throbbing vagina in it, I think this movie's definitely for you.